Hello everyone, and welcome back to Translation Born, the show that's all about translation, Bloodborne, and the translation of Bloodborne. We're still checking in on people after the Blood Moon, but for now, let's start with an item description. Moon Viewing Platform Key Key to the Moon Viewing Platform on the second floor of Bergenworth, which faces the lake. Towards the end of his life, Schoolhead Willem loved this place, rocking there in his armchair. And he, it is said, hid a secret in the lake. So, this is a fairly short set of lines, but they do introduce an important concept to the world of Bloodborne. It's actually included in the item name itself. You may have noticed that while my more literal translation was Moon Viewing Platform Key, the official version is a much more succinct Lunarium Key. But this translation has more going for it than just brevity. It also serves as a natural introduction for a feature of Bloodborne's architecture that I think ties in really well with what we know of the game world. By now, it's been pretty well established that the state of the moon has a huge impact on humanity. We've seen it in various notes scattered about the game world, referencing the burning of old Yarnum and the descent of some number of great ones, and we've been talking with people who've gone mad as a result of the Red Moon's revelation. That being the case, it makes sense for anyone interested in uncovering the secrets of this world to have an interest in the moon. Likewise, it seems entirely reasonable that Bergenworth would have a platform from which they could look out upon the moon. The issue then becomes what exactly such a place would be called. And this is also where cultural differences start to come into play. Because in Japan, the whole concept of tsukimi, or moon viewing, is already widely accepted as an idea. In fact, while the term can be used in general to refer to the act of admiring the full moon, it's also commonly associated both with a harvest festival that takes place in September or October, and a type of cooking that features eggs, with the idea that the cooked yolk ends up resembling a full moon. You can even get a tsukimi burger from McDonald's in the fall. To a certain extent, then, the concept of a moon viewing platform has some built-in associations for a Japanese player. I've even found real estate sites online that use the term skimidai to refer to literal platforms, either on the roof of a building or extended out over a pool, that are meant to be places where people can gather to admire the moon, or just hang out and have a good time. This level of cultural awareness isn't quite as strong in the English-speaking world, though, with the result that referring to a moon-viewing platform just sounds clunky to me. Yet by going into the Latin roots, the translation kills a few birds with one stone. First, since most people are familiar with the Latin luna, it still conveys the idea of being tied to the moon. Second, it gets this information across in a more succinct and natural sounding way. And third, it actually is able to bring in something of an existing idea in Western culture to bolster the idea of how the term is used in the game, because lunarium sounds a lot like solarium, which is generally used to refer to part of a house arranged to receive the sun's rays. Thought of in this way, the moon-based equivalent of a solarium could bring to mind the same image of a platform from which to view the moon that a Japanese player might visualize from the term tsukimidai. Now, there is an existing definition for the word lunarium in English, but I think literally walking out onto the moon viewing platform at Bergenworth goes a long way towards clearing up that ambiguity. Ultimately, I find this an elegant solution to an interesting problem that ends up informing the player about the world of Bloodborne in both languages. But speaking of problems, are you feeling okay? God, I'm nauseous. Have you felt this? It's progressing. I can see things. I knew it. I'm different. I'm no beast. I... Oh, God, it feels awful. But it proves that I'm chosen. Don't you see how they writhe, writhe inside my head? It's rather rapturous. <laughs> so I'm going to take that as a no. As for the translation, though, I think in general we're looking at another great example of dialogue being presented in a natural way. There is one line here I'm not so sure about, but before we get into any specifics, I'm actually going to put this woman out of her rapturous misery. That's because by doing so, at this specific point in the game, we can get a rather unique version of a familiar item, the third umbilical cord. Anyway, with that taken care of, let's turn back to this imposter's dialogue and go through some of the lines that stand out to me. 
We won't have to go too far to get to one either, since I was immediately struck by the treatment of the first line, which I think does a great job of presenting the same information as the Japanese, with the clarity that the more literal version I provided lacks. Starting with the initial phrase, right after an exclamation of unease, the imposter says something in Japanese that I've literally translated as, I feel bad, which already is potentially unclear. You can actually see this in the definition from my Daijisen Japanese Dictionary, where included in its first sense of the term being one of feeling physically or emotionally unwell, it goes on to describe a tightness of the chest or stomach combined with nausea. The example sentence for the century is, I ate too much and now I feel sick. Of course, in both languages, saying that you feel bad has a wide variety of meanings it can cover, both on a physical and an emotional level, so I recognize this is a pretty minor point, but I do think that the Japanese usage of the phrase has a stronger connotation of someone feeling sick to their stomach than the English. As a result, when the official translation uses, God, I'm nauseous, instead of, Ugh, I feel bad. I think that's a good way of specifying something to an English-speaking player that a Japanese-speaking player would otherwise be more likely to pick up. I also think the specificity helps players more strongly identify with what this character is going through. Feeling bad can be pretty generic, with no particular part of the body necessarily needing to be in pain. It's hard to latch onto. But everyone knows what it's like to feel nauseous, and that, I think, makes this line hit harder than if it had been translated more generically. What's more, I think this level of specificity about what the imposter is feeling helps inform the second half of this line, which is even more likely to be misleading if based off a strictly literal translation. Here, the Japanese is anata wakaru, which when directly translated is you, do you understand? Only translated this way, it makes it sound as if she's asking if we understand that she's not feeling well. This is technically possible, but I think a more likely interpretation is that she's asking if we understand how she feels, if we've had the same experience she's having. In other words, if we felt this same feeling ourselves, or at least are able to relate to it. By this interpretation, the translation of have you felt this is much clearer. And again, I think specifying that the imposter doesn't just feel bad in general, but that she has a specific feeling she's trying to convey, works better if the previous part of this line refers to her feeling nauseous. Taken all together, then, I think the official translation offers a lot more clarity here than a generic-sounding literal one. Where I'm less sure of things, by contrast, is in the line immediately following this one, because the subject for the first part of the sentence seems to be different in the English than the Japanese. In the original, the imposter begins with the word watashi, which is a way of saying I, making it clear that up until the feminine sentence ending particle no, she's talking about herself in the line I've literally translated as I've finally come this far. The official translation, by contrast, keeps the focus on her illness with the translation it's progressing. Now, if we interpret I've finally come this far to essentially mean I've finally advanced to this stage, that stage being the one in which she can see things, I can see how it's progressing would make sense. After all, by this interpretation, she's essentially saying that her treatment or illness has advanced to the point where she's able to see what was hidden from her before, something our character is experiencing as well. Still, I think the idea of the doctor talking about how far she's come gives her a bit more agency than attributing the progression either to an illness or some implied treatment. I feel like this is, in some sense, her accomplishment, and I'm not sure how well that's reflected by the existing translation. Of course, this could just be a result of my interpretation of things influencing my understanding of the line, but I did think it was worth mentioning since the subject does seem to change from one language to another here, and I'm not entirely sure why. Something I am sure of, though, is that the final lines of this dialogue have been rendered into English exceptionally well. From wakaru, or do you understand, being translated as don't you see? To the pause and repetition of the word writhe, the penultimate line here is full of exactly the sort of manic, crazed energy that this situation calls for. Then, to cap it all off, instead of using a general term for the pleasure the imposter is apparently feeling, the translation turns to rapturous. This, of course, is related to the word rapture, and looking at this word's definition in Merriam-Webster, I think this is an inspired choice for a few different reasons. For one thing, it works as a synonym for happy, which is arguably what a more literal translation for shiawase might be, so it conveys the proper idea. More importantly, though, it also has some really strong connotations that fit both the world of Bloodborne and the situation at hand. First, the sense of being carried away by an overwhelming emotion gets at that tension of heightened emotions as opposed to firm control that we've seen in the game before. And second, 
it referring to a mystical experience where the spirit is exalted to a knowledge of divine things is almost literally what's happening to the imposter at that moment. It was a great choice. But what do you think, Walter? Ah, how goes your hunt? Do not forget the League's mission to cooperate with Confederates, find vermin, and stamp them out. I guess you did always seem to have a one-track mind. Anyway, while this is a pretty short and straightforward set of lines, there is an interesting aspect of one of the translation choices on display here that I think it's worth paying attention to. You may have noticed that in my literal translation, Walter isn't opening with a general question of how our hunt is going like in the official version. He's asking if our hunt is going well. Then he opens his next line of dialogue with daga, which is one of a few ways to say however or but in Japanese, and then entreats us not to forget about the mission of the League as well. In the official translation, on the other hand, this grammatical reversal is dropped entirely. Walter simply goes from asking us how our hunt is going to exhorting us not to forget about the League. This might seem like it could amount to a pretty big change, and of course there are cases where certain grammatical reformulations can lead to large differences, but I want to emphasize first of all that I don't think the core meaning has been altered here. In broad terms, the Japanese opens by having Walter ask us if our hunt is going well, and then has him shift to a request not to forget about the League. This is exactly the meaning that gets transferred over in the English. The differences come down to phrasing and the connections between the two lines. As I've discussed before, however, Japanese sentence structure follows a lot of grammatical conventions that the English language doesn't. Often this comes in the form of really long sentences that can quickly become unwieldy in English if they're not broken down into smaller ones. Just for a quick example of this, let's turn back to the final portion of the Bloodshot Eyeball. Here, the literal translation I used back in episode 17 of Translation Born follows the Japanese grammar in that it's all one sentence. A beautiful eyeball plucked out right after death, or perhaps while the person is still alive, becomes a key to unlock a seal in the provincial tomb section of the underground ruins. I think you can hear how clunky that is, especially compared to the official an exquisite eyeball removed quickly after death, or perhaps even before, used to unlock the seal of the old labyrinth hinter tombs. Breaking this sentence down into smaller parts makes it easier to process in English. But long sentences are just one example of conventions that are common in Japanese writing that don't work as well when preserved in English. There's also the extensive use of onomatopoeia, extended sequences of ellipses, repetitive interrogatives, the emotive pronunciation of a character's name, and more. The point is, often to get the most natural sounding results in English, the Japanese sentence or paragraph structure needs to be rearranged, which is likely what we're seeing with Falter's lines here. Oh, and let's just take another moment of silence for that little girl we gave that ribbon. To finish the point about Walter's lines, though, note how much stronger a statement this line comes across as in English when the conjunction from the start and the either at the end is removed. Do not forget the League's mission, as opposed to, but don't forget the mission of the League, either. I think the former example is better writing, and since this also speaks to Walter's obsessive character, I'm glad it wound up being phrased the way it did. Now for one last item. Pearl Slug one of the materials necessary for a holy chalice ritual. Strange, small life forms reside in various places in the underground ruins. Slugs, in particular, are signs of an abandoned higher rank one. Again, this is a pretty short passage, but there are two things I think it's worth noting here. First, tying back in with the point I made earlier about Japanese writing following different conventions than English writing, I wanted to point out that both the official translation and my more literal one rework the structure of the second line of the Japanese here, albeit in different ways. One of these stylistic differences that comes up in Japanese writing is that often there will be a long passage modifying a noun that just stops there, and the second line of this item description is a good example of that. To get even more literal, the whole thing would translate to the strange, small life forms that nest in various places in the underground ruins. This can come off as pretty clunky, particularly after that opening line. If this description were to read, one of the materials necessary for a holy chalice ritual, the strange, small life forms that nest in various places in the underground ruins. Slugs in particular are signs of an abandoned higher rank one. I think you can hear how stilted that would be. So it makes sense instead to rearrange the grammatical structure a bit, as I mentioned earlier. More importantly to the lore of the game, though, is the repetition of a phrase we've seen before. Back in episode 29 of Translation Born, we looked at the description for the Augur of Abrietus, which included the Japanese phrase, Misterareta Jouisha Ebrietas. And here on the Pearl Slug is another reference to, Misterareta Jouisha. 
literally these might translate to the abandoned higher rank one, Ebriatus, and the abandoned higher rank one. In other words, one reading of the Japanese would suggest that slugs are a sign of Ebriatus, since that's the being associated by name with the phrase abandoned great one. Also, presumably different great ones would have different small creatures, most likely various kinds of mollusks, that would act as portents of their presence. Having established that, though, remember that Japanese is a highly contextual language, and it's not clear that the pearl slug is actually referring specifically to Abriatus. The auger of Abriatus spells out exactly which abandoned great one it's referring to based off the construction of the sentence. But since the phrase misterareta jōisha could be either singular or plural, it's hard to be sure whether the pearl slug is directly referring to Abriatus with this short set of words. Anyway, we're going to end on that ambiguous note, but keep this phrase in mind as we'll be seeing it again. In the meantime, let me know if you have any feedback, and thanks for watching, everyone.